So let's greet everyone who's joining us by live streaming this morning. God bless you. Great to have you on this journey with us today. Thank you for being here today, everybody. You know, the other night we had a wonderful service with Dennis Goldsworthy Davis. We had a powerful time. How many of you were here that night? Yeah, so you, you understand. It's a very different kind of service. You know, we let the Holy Spirit do his thing, and it was a powerful, powerful time. But, you know, if, if you're a first-time guest this morning, you need to understand this. Uh, or maybe you're a returning guest. Maybe you're a member here for a long time, but you have to understand this principle. The principle is that a guest speaker and what a guest speaker does does not define a local church. What defines a local church is what you see on an ongoing weekly basis. So I want you to imagine if an evangelist came in here for five days worth of meetings, what do you think that evangelist is going to do? He's going to talk about evangelism. He's going to bleed evangelism. He's going to spout evangelism. In other words, if you had a, a, a meter here, and this was no evangelism, and this was mega evangelism, it's going to go... He, by the time he's done, that thing's ready to snap off. If a prophet was running a three-day prophetic conference, guess what? So whatever the gifting is, uh, is going to be reflected in that person's, what comes out of that person and where we go with it, right? But guess what the, the understanding is from a traveling minister? That when he or she leaves, the meter's going to come back to where the local church really lives. But it's good to get stretched, right? It's good to get stretched. It's good to get challenged. It's good to get out of the comfort zone. And then when you come back, guess what? You'll never go back to the same size you were before. That's what we want. So... But some people don't understand that uh, what a local church does is what defines that church, not what a guest speaker might come in for one night and do or say or teach. Okay, so just understand that so you'll be able to share that with people in the future when we have guest speakers that come through and they say, wow, does this church do this every week? You know, people on the floor or whatever. Well, no. No, we don't. When the Holy Spirit moves, we let it move. Amen. And, when, and when it's not the Spirit of God, we are not going to go there. Otherwise, you sell your integrity, and you sell the integrity of the prophetic, you sell the integrity of, uh, you know, spiritual moving by operating in the flesh. Do not ever do that just to make the guest speaker happy. Because you're selling your integrity and the integrity of the whole operation. Don't ever do that. Okay? We want things to be done decently and in order. And we can be fully spiritual, but understand that we can be fully in order at the same time. It doesn't have to turn into a wild free-for-all because the Holy Spirit's moving. If he moves and it's a wild free-for-all, guess what? Everyone's going to feel it. And if he does that, I'm all right with it. Because it's going to lead somewhere, but it better lead somewhere. Okay, so uh, we want to just congratulate a couple people. We want to congratulate Randy Tapp on his master's degree. Now, help me out, Randy. Is it in biblical counseling? Pastoral ministry? Okay. Master of Divinity and Pastoral Counseling. Now, yeah. And then, of course, her son, Pastor Petey. Got his bachelor's degree, both from Liberty University. And uh, what was your major? Uh, the exact name? Biblical and Theological Studies. Biblical and Theological Studies. Great. And, uh, and I think both of these guys, correct me if I'm wrong, were cum laude? Yeah, yeah, well, he was anyway. Okay, good. And also, Asaka Etuka graduated yesterday, cum laude. That's pretty awesome. We've got a bunch of sharp young people. Randy, you're young today, all right? 
Today's your day. <laughs> what? Oh, Asaka, Magnum Kulawi. Okay. Okay. Can't keep up with all these honors here. Now, Thursday night, as I said, Dennis ministered, ministered for a long time prophetically and laying hands on people, etc. And uh, so it got too late to receive the offering. So as I said on Thursday, we're going to do that right now. Let's do that real quick, please. As he ministered and pressed into the Spirit of God for us, we had some tremendous prophetic words. Please check out that service in our archives. Go online, check out the service from Thursday night because what he said prophetically over the church has an impact on us all. So that means it's, it's for you too. All right, so uh, where are the ways to give, guys? Flash that up there. It's coming. It's coming up soon. I know it is. There it is. All right, so there, uh, if you want to give to Dennis, please, I would encourage you to do that. We take care of the servants of God. God will always take care of us. But there, if you're going to do it electronically, you'll see on our electronic giving por uh, portal there that there's already an account set up for Dennis Goldsworthy Davis, so you can just designate your funds accordingly, okay? Of course, if you're making out a check, just make it to victory, and we're going to go from there. Praise God. Thank you, everybody. You know, Dennis was sharing the other night, he travels all over the world. And he said he'll go to some places, minister one, two services. He'll pour it all out. And he leaves with 50 bucks. It's just not right. Or in some cases, they take his offering and they use it for the church and give him nothing. It's terrible. It's terrible what goes on and we have never done that and we will never do that. Or they'll invite him in and make him pay for his own plane ticket to get there. It's just stupid. It's like, hey, I want to invite you over to my house for dinner. Would you come? Sure, I'll come. Good, bring the roast. <laughs> Is that idiotic? But that's church life. So it's terrible that pastors would do that. And so just not going there. Okay, so today we're going to talk about, we've been going through this series on our core values here at Victory. Why is it important? It's important so that you know what makes us tick, right? That you know what we're built on, what we stand on, what we believe in, what we put value in, and what guides us philosophically in our core values. So it's important that you know that. So today we're going to cover core value number three. The first one was evangelism, and then we covered the importance of uh, team ministry, right? Everything doesn't center around the pastor. It centers around the pastor building a team, and we all do in team ministry together. Core value number three is that we believe in excellence as a church. I didn't see perfection. I said excellence. You better believe in excellence, too. If you don't believe in excellence, that means you believe in being a slacker. We got too many slackers in America now. Don't add to the list. Certainly not as a, as a child of God, one who has God's word, access to God's wisdom, understanding what God will bless and what he won't, which is what we're going to uncover today and explore together. Don't ever settle for being a slacker in life. Be sharp in all that you do, and we're going to talk about that. But this value of excellence is one of our core values. It's always been, even since... We began, we launched this church. Next month, by the way, it'll be 32 years ago that we launched the church. Yeah. 32 years ago with one guy in a living room envisioning days like this. And it was pretty amazing that uh, already 32 years have gone by. But we've tried to stay diligent every day of those 32 years. I don't ever come up here and give it half my effort. I don't ever stand up here half prepared. I don't put no preparation time in and say, I feel led to have a testimony night. 
I feel led all right because I'm a slacker. Uh-uh. When we have testimony nights, it's planned a long time ahead. And we have a testimony night. Now, if the Holy Spirit does something sovereign, we let him do it. And we say, let's just share our hearts to glorify the Lord tonight. But that's going to be the exception rather than the rule. Why? Because it's my job to be prepared in what I do. To try and bring you the very best, right? To bring us into green pastures as God gives me to do that. Now, we've always held to this principle since day one of this church. If we can't do it right, we're just not going to do it. Again, I didn't say perfectly. I said to the best of our ability, whether it's financial or personnel-wise or maybe building facility or the size of the congregation, whatever it is, we have to respect our limitations, but within those limitations, be the very best that we can. And so our guiding principle has always been if we can't do it right, we're just not going to do it. We'll just put it off till next year, and maybe we'll be in a better position to do it right. I remember way back when we did our first harvest party on Halloween night, right? As a godly alternative, (laughs) Dean, you remember, (laughs) as a godly alternative to people celebrating Halloween. We wanted to open the house of the Lord and give people an opportunity to have fun in God's house. That to show them the love of God and to show them that the house of the Lord wasn't a bunch of thou shalt nots. And so we want to provide an alternative. No devils, no demons, no ghosts, no skeletons, but Bible characters and fun. And so when we first started it, it was very small. You know, we had to just make these little booths and, right, piece of plywood here, a piece of plywood there. I mean, I got smashed in the face with pies all night long (laughs) until someone got the bright idea of using shaving cream. Try and get that rammed up your nose. <laughs> it's not snorting that you want to do. So, Because it burns. Not meant to go up your nose and in your eyeballs. Right? It's like inhaling wasabi. So. so that was a bad night for me at the end of the night, but it was a great night in the beginning of the night. And so we did the very best we could. I remember our first Christmas banquet, we had, you know, 25 people there. Our first harvest party, we had, I don't know, 30, 40 people there with parents and grandparents. And, and now it's huge. We've got 1,000, over 1,000 people coming in there. But everything we've done, done whoa, I don't know what that is, but <laughs> we've tried to do the very, very best that we could, or we're just not going to do it. Because your typical church junk is exactly that. Junky, disorganized, chaotic, chaotic, and it doesn't glorify the Lord. Um, So even way back, we used to tell guest speakers when they would want to come in and do maybe a crusade or an outreach or whatever, we would tell them, look, this is the size church we are. These are our financial realities. We'll be able to do this, but we can't do that. We'll be able to put you up at... I remember our first guest speakers were at the, uh, what is it, the Super 8 in Cromwell or Motel 6, whatever that one is near McDonald's in Cromwell. I said, look, that's all we could afford. Oh, that's okay. No, that's fine. Then the offering, which wasn't much, look, this is every penny that comes in you're going to get, I promise you. Okay. But we were honest with people, but we, we wanted to do things with excellence and not have them minister all week and then, whoa. And so we would tell them we can do this, we can't do that, maybe we'll have to delay that until the next time you come. But we hold to these same principles to this day. You know, our church may not be the biggest or technically the best in America, but we're going to approach all that we do with excellence every step of the way. Does that make sense to you? So as we approach this teaching today, Uh, you might find in your outlines that it may not be totally loaded with scriptures, but there are certainly scriptural principles woven all throughout in what you'll hear me talk about today that back up and support what we're going to say and why. So I want you to understand this is not a glorified Tony Robbins uh, seminar just because we're talking about excellence, but I'm hoping by the word of God 
and the principles of God to maybe change and maybe elevate your thinking a little bit more so that how you approach life in general, both inside and outside the church, can be altered and upgraded for the glory of God. Okay, let's go to Ecclesiastes chapter 9. But we're going to have to move. Ecclesiastes chapter 9. And then we're going to look at one verse in verse 10, chapter 10, and we're going to look at one verse in chapter 9. So let's begin in chapter 9. The verse in chapter 9 is in verse 10. Ecclesiastes 9 in verse 10. Solomon said, Whatever your hand finds to do, do it half heartedly. That is, until the boss comes around. Is that what he says? Oh, wait a minute. Whatever your hand finds to do in this life, do it with all of your might. Because we only have a certain time frame in which to live, right? He said, because there's no work or device or knowledge or wisdom in the grave where you're going. What he's saying is, what he's echoing is Ecclesiastes 3, which he also wrote, right? Uh, to everything there's a season. And there is a specific and limited time frame for every purpose to be unfolded and walked out here under the heavens. And then that chapter's closed and it's called a person's life. So he said, while you are doing the will of God in the earth, whatever that looks like, naturally and spiritually, do it with all of your might. Verse 10 now of chapter 10. Chapter 10 in verse 10 says, if the axe is dull, and if one does, and one does not sharpen the edge, then he must use more strength to get the job done, correct? But wisdom brings success. Wisdom gives us, the Hebrew says, a successful advantage. Wisdom gives us a successful advantage. So if you look at the ninth chapter, the first verse that we looked at, he's talking about whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might, but he's not saying... Just work and work and work and don't grow in wisdom and strategies. Because chapter 10, he says, look, if you're given the task of chopping down a tree, take the first portion of the, time, the allotted time to sharpen your axe so that you can get more done with less strenuous effort and more wisdom guiding you. So you understand there's a built-in need for wisdom. There's an implied need for growth, but there's also an implied <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> necessity to have an attitude that's good. A mentality that what you're doing in this life is important because you're important. <clears throat> and that what you do in the earth, if you do with all your might, is you're going to generate the greatest ripple, the greatest impact, and you're going to give God something to bless. Does that make sense to you? Remember when all those people were hungry and Jesus said, hey, disciples, yeah, go feed these guys. They said it would take a year's worth of wages to feed this crowd. I said, well, so Jesus is stretching them. He said, well, then who's got what? Anybody have anything? And most of them said, I got nothing. And one guy said, no, wait a minute. There is a teenager here. He's got a couple of fish and some loaves of bread. Being, now you're onto something. It's called adapt, improvise, overcome. Be creative. Bring that kid here, teenager. Kid brings the loaves and the fishes. Jesus blesses it, breaks it, and guess what? A spirit of multiplication was brought on, even what he did have. It didn't matter what he had, it mattered what he brought. It mattered what he brought, not what he had. What he had is what he started with. But what he ended with was quite a different story. Once he offered that to the Lord, and once that was brought to Jesus, notice Jesus didn't pull the fish out of a tree. He didn't say, ready? Close your eyes now. One, two, three. Fish. <laughs> no, he said, who has what? In effect. Well, where are we going to go from here, guys? Well, oh, well, well, this kid has fish. Boom, now you're on to something. Bring him. See, we have to bring him our very best so that he has something to bless. I'm telling you, there are some people that wouldn't come to a special service if Jesus was ministering. 
They wouldn't. Just wouldn't. Why? Because they adopted a mentality that Jesus has to fit into their schedule of life. He's not a hobby. If you're a Christian and treating Jesus as a hobby, you're in trouble. And when you stand before him, it's going to be a real eye-opening experience for you when he goes over the DVD of your life. You've got a lot to answer for. Because you've slid into a backslid mentality treating Jesus as a hobby. If he fits into your couch time, your sleep time, your sack time, your soccer, baseball, football, whatever time, if he fits in between all that, it's cool. If not, well, he's just going to have to deal with it. Oh, he will deal with it. You mark my words, he will deal with it. But it's not something you want him to deal with. That's why the scripture is clear. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. Don't make him come and humble you. Humble yourself that he might lift you up, exalt you, and use you in due season. But the first approach is, I expect you to humble yourself under my mighty head. Because if you don't, you will be humbled. Because Jesus said there's only two ways in the kingdom, correct? Fall on the rock, that the rock breaks you to pieces, or the rock falls on you and grinds you to powder. I'll take option A. See, either way, you got to deal with the rock. So let's go on our introduction here. Still glad you came so far? All right, I'll keep giving you body shots. All right, no. I'm wearing you now to the later rounds. Okay, here's the principles that we wrap our heads around here at Victory. That God is worthy of our very best. Not halfway, not a quarter of the way. That if you're a member here at Victory or you're thinking about it, this is what we subscribe to. That he's worthy of our best. If he's not, then you need to rethink your salvation. Everything in life should be done with a spirit of excellence. That's principle number two, right? Third, excellence cannot be achieved without constant self-examination. Consistent, I should say, self-examination. You've got to go a certain distance and then stop and examine yourself and see where you're at. See if you're bearing more fruit than you did five years ago. See where you're at in your walk with Christ. See where you're at in life. See where you're at in your mentality, your attitudes, your energy level, your ambition, your passion for him. Where are you in the wider scheme of things? If you just let it roll on and on and on, I'll tell you what, it's dangerous. It's dangerous. It's like a car that's rolling down the highway and it's approaching a hill. But right about then, you take your foot off the gas pedal because you assume that the momentum you had yesterday is going to carry you up over the mountain. And you know what happens when you assume. You can't run on yesterday's fumes. You've got to stoke the fire today. You've got to rebuild that baby today. You've got to keep the fire lit today. But if I never look at my fireplace, I'm going to assume because the fireplace exists, everything's good. It's not about the existence of the fireplace. It's whether or not I'm allowing that to generate purpose in me. Next, excellence is not predicated upon one's educational level or financial position. Gee, I don't have that much money, so? I mean, I didn't make it out of high school, so? I live in a poorer area of town, so? Does that mean you should be dirty? Does that mean you can't wash your clothes? Does it mean you shouldn't own an iron? Does it mean you shouldn't occasionally use shampoo? What does that have to do? What does one thing have to do with the other? Other than the battle being lost between your ears. I don't have much money, therefore I can live this way. Really? Is that the way you want to live? Well, no. Well, that's the way you're living. Don't blame God for not pulling you out of something that you're okay with. Lord, deliver me. I will. I want you to deliver you from you first. And then from that poverty spirit that you allowed between your ears to govern your behavior. 
Stop blaming the rest of the world for poor mentality. And next, excellent honors God. And guess what else it does? It inspires people around us. When someone is ambitious, when someone has a good attitude, when someone is excellent, if they're doing that the right way, it inspires people around them. How many of you know that somebody with a bad attitude pollutes people around them? But someone with a good attitude inspires people around them. That's why there's an atmosphere. Someone is creating that, or someone has hijacked it. And last, this is not in your notes, but we believe that just as the moon does not generate light in and of itself, but the moon reflects the sun's light, the church is supposed to be a reflection of an excellent God to a lost and dying world. How can we do that? By living and walking in the light as he is in the light. How does he think? He thinks creatively. He thinks ambitiously. He thinks victory. He thinks all these things that we need to wrap our heads around and get the mind of Christ. See, the, where Paul said, for we have the mind of Christ, that is a, a theological principle, but we need to make that a functional reality. That got quiet. Really quiet. Actually, that, that deserved one amen. I mean, it was a one amen statement at least. Okay. All right, let's go to Roman numeral two now. Just as a working template here, this is how excellence can be defined. First, first blank is efficiency. Efficiency is when somebody gets the job done right. Effectiveness is getting the right job done. See, it's been, it's been noted that the clear difference between a leader and a manager is that a manager does things right, but a leader knows the right things to do. See, I can do the wrong thing perfectly. Like rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic. And so efficiency is getting things done right. Effectiveness means i got to know the right thing to do first. But last, excellence being a combination of both, excellence is getting the right job done right. Isn't that a great working little template there? All right, so let's, let's go through these rather quickly. The eight biblical keys to excellence. So we're asking this question, then, okay... I haven't heard this stuff before. Maybe I have, and I've, let, I've kind of turned loose of it. How do we get from where we are today to where God wants us to be? How do we move from being okay with being okay to, no, I want to live an excellent life? How do I get from here to there? Number one, you've got to value excellence. If I don't value it, I'm not going to pursue it. What I value, I treasure. And Jesus said wherever someone's treasure is, there their heart is going to be also. So I've got to put it as a value, which means I've got to treasure it. Therefore, the center of my attention and my affection will then be tethered to what I value. Right? So i got to value excellence. Now look at the quote I've put on here for you. Success bases our worth on a comparison with others. When you really define success, it's based upon a comparison with other people around you. I'm successful, you're not. I'll show you by my bank book. But success is a much, needs a much broader definition. So success, generally speaking, is based upon worth comparing you with somebody else. Excellent, however, gauges our value by measuring us against our own potential. That's who we need to be in competition with, our own potential, not the person on the side of us. Success grants its rewards to the few, but it is the dream of the multitudes. Isn't that true? Excellence, however, is available to all living beings, but is accepted and truly sought by the few. You know, it's been said... Um, 
that there are two types of people in America and in the church sometimes. Those who are willing to work and those who are willing to watch them. Which will you be? When, when a call comes out, hey, we need 20 people, right? Listen to this. 20 people just to give us quick sweep to the fellowship hall. If it doesn't even go through your cranium, if it goes right through without hitting anything, to be one of those 20, you need to say, Lord, help me. Lord, help me. If it doesn't even cross your mind, outside of a physical limitation, if it doesn't even cross your mind, you got to say, Lord, help me. Because of putting out a plea so that our house can be swept for the glory of God. I wouldn't say it for no reason. There'd be a specific reason why we need just 20 people. And with 20 people with brooms in a fellowship hall, 10 minutes, we'd all be done. If it doesn't even cross through your mind, if it goes straight through and you don't hear any bells or buttons like a pinball machine, does it doesn't hit anything. <laughs> then this, then this might be as hollow as that. And you might have a hollow head here, but you don't want to have a hollow heart in dealing with Jesus. On that basis of it going straight through, how would you ever expect the Lord to be blessing you to the highest extent of what he wants? How, what basis of expectation would you ever have? I'll tell you what, none except hope against hope. But somehow he didn't see that. Number two. You see, you can't get to excellence without me challenging you a little bit. So you understand that illustration was a big challenge, and I hope it was, because it comes down to those things. Listen, it comes down to those things. It's like this. If somebody says, man, pastor, I wish I'd hit the lottery, $300 million, and I would tithe to the church. I said, are you tithing now? Well, no, you definitely wouldn't tithe then. You'd have a coronary before that check was made out. You'd never live to spend it. Talking about making out a check to $30 million to the kingdom of God, and you don't tithe with what you have now? You better call Hunter's Ambulance before the checkbook comes out. <laughs> Get everyone ready. Get Edwin Luster here with his medical... Get Eddie come up. Get everyone ready. Alert Middlesex Hospital <laughs> that there may be incoming soon. Then we'll open the envelope to see what you've got. And then the checkbook to see what you'll do. Because it, it just wouldn't follow. It wouldn't follow because it's a character issue. It's an obedience issue that it's already getting a double F minus on. How are you going to be an A student overnight? Whoo, I told you you get challenged today. It's all right. I only get to beat you a little while longer. So, all right, number two, you got to refuse to settle for average in your life. You got to refuse to settle for it, and you can do it. I'm talking about refusing to settle for mediocrity. If it can be done right, why do it halfway? If it can be done right. Vince Lombardi, great legendary football coach, said, the quality of a person's life is in direct proportion to their commitment to excellence, regardless of their chosen field of endeavor. And you see the quote under point number two, and this is so true. A racehorse that can run a mile just one second or a millisecond Faster than all the others is worth many times more than every other horse on that track. Who wins the enormous pot? The horse that maybe has a photo finish. Everybody else is a loser. Now, unlike in life in America now, there are no participation trophies. One person gets the pot and the others get a good dinner later and wonder what went wrong. 
Number three, you got to live with awareness in life and pay attention to detail. You got to live with an awareness and pay attention to detail. You know, Stu Leonard, we got Stu Leonard stores. Stu Leonard, the founder of Stu Leonard, ironically enough, uh, he said his motto was do it right the first time. He said that's what he subscribed to the day he opened his first store. Do it right the first time. Abraham Lincoln, you familiar with him? He said, I do the very best that I know how to, the very best that I can, and I mean to keep on doing so until the end of my days. That was just it. That's just what guided him, and that was the end of the story. Nothing else was allowed into his philosophical field of view. And I think he accomplished some great things. You see the quotes under point three, just a small leak can sink even a great ship. I refer to the Titanic, remember that? Even God couldn't sink this ship. Well, God didn't have to. Now let's go to number four. Number four is that you must possess a high level of ethics and integrity. You'll never move in excellence if you're going to cut corners and not tell the truth or whatever, you know, if you're going to do shady deals, it's going to crash and burn. Johann von Schiller said this, he who has done his very best for his own time has lived for all times. Isn't that powerful? He that has done his very best in his own time has lived for all times. That means his legacy will impact future generations or hers. Now look at the scripture here, Daniel chapter 6, verse 3. Now Daniel so distinguished himself. You notice, you notice what, he'd done? what he had done? He distinguished himself. That means he was in the middle of the pack, and he did things to distinguish himself from the pack. But he so distinguished himself from the pack of administrators and other sub-leaders in the kingdom of Babylon. Why? Because an excellent spirit was found in him, so much so that the king, an unsaved guy, planned to set him over the whole kingdom. Now, I want you to know something about Daniel. First, he was very young. Second, he was taken into captivity as a teenager. So here he was, a Hebrew boy, Jewish boy, brought into captivity in a godless Babylon, modern-day Iraq. Still all messed up. Right? So he's taken from Israel. He's taken captive into Babylon, a godless, crazy culture. They try to brainwash him out of his Jewish heritage, out of his Jewish roots. They even tried to change his name. He refused to subscribe to his name change. He never referred to him by his Babylonian name. The Babylonians changed his name away from the Hebrew and called him something else. But he never identified himself as such. And they tried to erase his memory of the scriptures and, and of Israel and all that God had done. And, and they tried to weave him into the wisdom and the ways of the Babylonian culture. But he refused to be washed and impacted and polluted with what he knew was madness and falsehood. So he was able to keep his identity. He purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the king's delicacies. He purposed in his heart that I will keep my integrity before God. And the word ethics comes from the Greek word ethos which translated means a system of values. So when somebody is ethical, that means they have a high system of values. When someone is unethical, that means whatever value system they had is in the toilet. It's been compromised. There's a virus. But Daniel would not allow that to happen, even though God called him to start his ministry in captivity. Think about that. Daniel was called by God to start his ministry in captivity. And even in captivity, as a young man under 
uh, mental assault of the Babylonians. He kept his identity, keep, kept his mentality, kept an excellent spirit in him, and God rose him straight to the top. That's what can happen to you. You don't have to be the sharpest knife in the drawer. You don't have to be the very best worker on a technical basis. You don't have to have the most education on a technical basis. But there are other intangibles that go a lot farther than that stuff. And that's what's within your grasp to have. You see in the shaded box here, it said your personal quest for excellence can be another way of saying to the world, my character is showing. As long as we seek excellence and accept nothing less, our dreams and endeavors will succeed, for it is the surest way to greatness and to God's blessing. Why should God bring someone into a purpose of high level when they don't even care about going there? <laughs> it's insane. So let's get out of the daydream. Let's get our feet on the ground and let's get on with it. Number five. You must show genuine respect for others. And I would add and love, respect and love. If you're going to move in excellence and succeed in this life and be blessed by God, in other words, as the author of your success, you've got to have genuine love and respect for other people. Because there's no such thing as success achieved alone. Right. See what it says, Matthew 7, 12. Jesus said, this has to be our guiding principle, what's known as the golden rule. Therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them. For this is the essence of what is taught in the law and the prophets. And I like to also put it this way. Whatever harvest you want next year, you start to sow seeds of it today. What do you want in five years? Well, I'd like to do this and have that. And, uh, start to sow those seeds today. You cannot reap where you haven't sown. It's insanity. Because then you're moving in a spirit of entitlement. That's not going to work in God's kingdom. Salvation is free, but everything else in the kingdom of God is going to cost you. Right. Salvation is the only free gift. Everything else is going to cost you. It's going to cost you praying when other people are talking. It's going to cost you to be awake and creative and thinking and when other people are doing this. It's going to cost you serving when other people are just drinking coffee, watching you. See, it's just going to cost you all kinds of different things along the way. You know why? Because in the kingdom of God, there's no, thing, no such thing as leadership from the rear. And if you're first, you're going to get the wind, the waves, the lightning bolts, the attacks, the arrows. If you're going to be first, you're going to catch all the madness and protect everybody else from it. So if you're not willing to deal with that, you understand that you're not going to soar very high because every rung of the ladder you go up is going to be more costly than the one prior to it. You understand that? What you could get away with down on this rung, when the Lord advances you to that rung, you can't get away with the same stuff. The road gets narrower. The pathway gets a little bit more narrow. The gate is narrow. Excellence becomes only a true part of us uh, when we live practicing the golden rule without giving it a second thought. That is only possible when we elevate the worth of others to the same level we hold for ourselves. Look at this last quote under this point, point five. I love this one. He says, you can't make another person truly feel valued and important in your presence if you secretly feel like he's a nobody. Your own heart will betray you. So we have to change our mentality about other people around us. You can't be successful in the true sense of the world, word without valuing people. You got to be a people person. Well, I never was much of a, well, you better become one. God, help me. Lord, help me. 
to be a people person, to become a people person. And that will happen one person at a time. If you're the kind of person that really never talked to anybody, then you might say, God, help me. And I'm going to talk to one person today. I'm going to be the initiator and actually have a pleasant conversation. I don't care if you get an index card. Oh, I'm sorry, that's paper. I don't care if you put on your iPhone. <laughs> Forgive me, I went the paper trail. All right. <laughs> I went my dinosaur route for a second. Now, hold on. Let me come back. Forget the paper. You go on your iPhone, and you, you know, there's plenty of books out there. Get some sample questions in your phone. In other words, conversation openers. Get five of them that whoever you talk to, you lead in with those five questions. You get a conversation started, right? So it's like lighting the fuse. If you go up to someone and say, yeah, I want to talk. <laughs> Keith, I'd like to talk with you. And you say, okay. I have no idea what I want to say to you. Okay. You're Keith, right? Yeah, yeah. Just making sure. Okay, you have a good day. We're done. But if I say, hey, your name Keith? Yeah, my name's Peter, yeah. Hey, so how you doing? Good. What do you do here in the church? What's your, you in the ministry here? Yeah. Whoa, what do you do for a living? Wow, that's, wow, how'd you get into all that? That's great. You know, are you married? You have a family? Where, where'd you grow up? Yeah, did you go to school somewhere? Oh, man, that's awesome. You understand, I'm bullet pointing, but that could be an hour's worth of conversation because if Keith's the guy that really wants to talk about himself, <laughs> which he's not, <laughs> so you'd need those questions. No, no. No, you see, he's feeling so valued by the questions I'm asking him, he actually thinks I, I care about his life. <laughs> and I should. It's not a game. I'm finding out about him. And then he's going to find out about me. And guess what? The next time I see him, we instantly will remember the conversation, and it's, it's all good. Now I have a friend. Okay, number six. <laughs> number six, never hesitate to go the extra mile in life. Doesn't matter how people in your business, wherever you work, doesn't matter how they work, go the extra mile. Do something different. Do something above and beyond. Listen, what your union requirement is laying on you. Do something above that. Not just what's required. Require more of yourself. Don't just do what's expected. Hold yourself to a higher standard than your boss is holding you to. I mean, things have gotten so stupid in our places of business now. Somebody was just telling me recently, yeah, well, I do. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm in this particular union. It's a trades union. I said, yeah. I can't, he said, you realize how crazy it is now? I can't even pick up a hammer and give it to a carpenter. I can get written up for that. Yeah, listen. He said there were four two-by-fours. Four two-by-fours. You know how much a two-by-four weighs? Not much. Four two-by-fours. It was a requirement that two union carpenters had to get just those two-by-fours four, those four by, two and walk it from this place to this. Two guys had to do it, or they get written up. <laughs> Might have to get rushed to the hospital. <laughs> you see, so there's good and bad with all that stuff. But don't just get lulled. Don't settle for all that stuff. Have your attitude. Think beyond the boundaries of what's required. Hold yourself to a higher standard than that. See, Jesus said, look at your notes. If you're faithful in little things, you'll be faithful in large ones. 
But if you're dishonest in little things, you won't be honest with greater responsibilities. I've just chosen this translation. Jesus said, and if you are untrustworthy about worldly wealth. See, there are some believers even that if they don't come to church, they don't give. Like they only give if they come. What's that about? Should the Lord only protect you when you're here? Should he only keep his covenant when you're here? No, you want him to be on the job 24 hours a day, but you're reducing your giving to an admission fee to church. But you want to be, you, you interpret yourself as being a mature Christian. Really? You better re-examine yourself. That's why, listen, one of the greatest things you can do is get on automatic giving on the push pay because it keeps you honest, which is why God set up giving in the Old Testament in the first place to keep the Jews honest. That's what he said. The first part of the giving goes to me. It's already mine. You're really not even giving it to me. I'm allowing you to participate in my financial program. But it, don't get it wrong. It doesn't belong to you. It already belongs to me. But I'll just take that. And when you do that, and the reason why I'm setting it up for you to do that is to save you from you. Because I'm going to bless you and I'm going to prosper you and I'm going to keep you from selfish living once you begin to prosper. So start it when you're small. Start it when, it's, when, you, know, when you should. And it keeps you from you and it keeps you in the center of the blessing. Please. Dale Carnegie said, never hesitate to give your very best to what seemingly are small, insignificant jobs. Every time, uh, I'm sorry, every time you conquer one, it makes you that much stronger. If you do little jobs well, the big ones tend to take care of themselves. Oprah Winfrey said, doing my best at this present moment puts me in the best place for the next moment. And like her or not, She's made a few bucks along the way. She can buy small nations outright. And when I read this quote I wanted to share with you. It says, people will forget how fast you did a job, but they'll always remember how well you did it. Man, that guy was fast. Did he do a job? No, it's a disaster. But I really want to commend him on how fast he screwed everything up. You think you'd get a referral out of that? Sure. See this guy's photo? Yeah, never use him. He's a train wreck going somewhere to happen. Number seven. Strive each day to develop consistency. And you might add reliability. Consistency, reliability, that's the spirit here. One quote says this, what people say, what people do, and what people say they do are, in most cases, entirely different things. <laughs> so look at what Paul said. When we're going to talk about consistency, he said, let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap if we don't give up. Sometimes we give and give and give, and then people quit just before the reaping time comes. But he says it's going to take consistent sowing to bring you into a, pl a place in time of reaping. you got to be consistent. You can't be like this and wonder why the harvest is all messed up. Hello? Right? I mean, you know, you can't be like this in your workplace and wonder why you don't get promoted. Your attitude one day is up here. The next day, you're the biggest grouch in your workplace. The next day, you're on time. The next day, you're three hours late and give no excuse for it. Gee, why don't I get promoted? They don't like me. That's right, they don't. <laughs> I don't like you either. <laughs> so when we talk about consistency, I think there's two key areas. First, our work ethic, as I've just alluded to, because there's a scriptural principle that says, lazy hands make a man or a woman poor, but diligent hands bring wealth. Not just financial wealth. The hand of the diligent, not the hand of the smartest, not the hand of the best looking, not the, the hand of the diligent will always bring good things. Just be diligent. 
Now, our work ethic. Second, uh, I'm sorry, second scripture. Proverbs 22, do you see a man skilled in his work? He will serve before kings, and he will not serve before obscure men. Right? You come to good places. When your skill set is elevated, and you do the very best with the best attitude. So our work ethic, and the second area that's crucial in terms of success and excellence is in our keeping our word. You see Psalm 15, verse 1 and verse 4. Psalm 15 says, Lord, who may worship in your sanctuary? Who may enter your presence on your holy hill? And just one other ways that question is answered is those who keep their word, that means their promises, even when it hurts. If you, can't, if you make a promise, if you make a vow, keep it. If you can't keep it, then let the person on the other end know way ahead of time, I'm sorry, I'm unable to keep this one because of a, you know, Something happened, but I will make it up. Don't just blow it off. So my question to you is, do you show up when you're supposed to? Do you follow through on things? Or start something and then drop everything halfway and not follow through? How many of you know that starting something and following through are equally as important? And it all has to do with keeping our word. Listen, if we lose, if our word loses value, we have lost value. See, we hang on to God's word because his word is his revealed character. He says, you can trust my word because my character is the bank account upon which that check is written. And as surely as I live, you can trust my word. See, so we trust the word because we trust God. His character is the bank account upon which his check is written. But what about us as people? Our word is only as good as our character. So let's keep that beefed up, right? Number eight, we're going to close with this. Always strive to make excellence a lifestyle. Always strive to make excellence not something that you do on Christmas and Easter. Make it a lifestyle. Colossians 3, whatever you do, Work at it with all your heart as though you were working for the Lord and not for people. Remember that the Lord will give you the reward. Then Joshua 1.8 says, Get God's word in you. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do according to all that's written in it. For then, circle the word then. After you do the first part of this, then you will make your way in the earth prosperous and then you'll have good success. And you see at the bottom, Aristotle said, excellence is an art won by training and habituation. That means repetition. We do not act rightly because we have virtue or excellence, but rather, but we rather have those because we've acted rightly. When we've done the right thing, we have virtue and excellence. We are what we repeatedly do. Excellence, therefore, is not an act, but it's a habit. Excellence, therefore, is not just a single-time act, but excellent after doing it and doing it and doing it. It's a habit. Wow. Sound good? Okay. Let's stand, please. Thanks for watching. We would love for you to do two things. First, click the logo and subscribe to our channel. And second, like, comment, and share our videos with those whom you care about. We're always updating our page with the latest messages and original content. Thanks for watching.